Hey everybody, I'm DJ Sixman. Today I'm joined by Eamon Javers. He's got a brand new documentary, Crypto 911, Exposing a Bitcoin Billionaire. Eamon, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So there's a really fascinating story here, and it's a guy named Jimmy Zong, and you were down in Georgia for this story. When did you first learn about him, and why did you want to tell this story? You know, we got a tip from a source that there was a really interesting story here, and we started looking at some of the public documentation around it and all the different evidence that had been presented uh, in public, and what we found was just a fascinating mystery of one of the biggest crypto heists of all time, one that had kind of become legendary in the crypto world, the 2012 hack of the Silk Road, which was a dark web site where people were exchanging bitcoins in those years for drugs, guns, pornography, and other things in the dark web. Somebody stole money, a lot of money, 50,000 bitcoins from that dark website. And that kind of became legendary because people watched the value of that hoard of stolen Bitcoin go up and up and up in the subsequent years to the point where at one point it was worth more than $3 billion. And there was this question of who did this and were they going to get away with it and were they going to be able to spend all that money? So the government had been searching for years for this cryptocurrency that was stolen from the Silk Road. How did a break in at Jimmy's place kind of get the government going down that trail? Well, what was fascinating about this is that they were unsuccessful. The government had been looking at this for years and years. There were, they had some hints, there were some clues. They thought they knew a direction to go in, but they weren't really able to crack the case until this guy named Jimmy Zong in Athens, Georgia, called 911 one night to report that there had been a theft at his house and someone had stolen $400,000 worth of cash and some Bitcoin from his house and police went to investigate what had happened. Uh, one of the many questions they had about this was, you know, how did you get all of this money? It was a modest off campus near the uh, bungalow near the University of Georgia, uh, very, kind of student housing in a neighborhood where a lot of like apartments with college kids are, not a giant mansion. And so the question for Jimmy Zong, who at that point was in his 20s uh, and living and going to the bars in Athens and drinking with the college crowd and all that stuff was, you know, what were you doing with a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash? And those questions started to unspool an answer to a mystery that went back years. Zong's a pretty interesting guy. He went to the University of Georgia, big computer science guy, but big partier, was looking for friends. What was most shocking about what you learned about him in your reporting? He's just such a fascinating character. You so many contradictions embedded in Zong. He's the he's the ultimate computer nerd. You know, staying up all night. You know, in cryptocurrency forums. You know, coding away all evening on his laptop. And yet he's out partying in the bars, uh, rallying people to his house. He installed a uh, stripper pole in his basement at one point for the wow. epic parties that he threw there. So he was this party boy nerd figure uh, who seemed to be just desperate for human connection. Um, and I think he thought that he could use his skills. He was an incredibly brilliant and skilled coder, is an incredibly skilled and brilliant coder. And I think at some point he thought he could use those skills to kind of connect with uh, humanity and connect with a group of friends. He wanted companionship, he wanted love, he wanted romance, he wanted the human things that we all want in some ways. And he just never was fully able to get those. Uh, even when he was able to deploy sort of his superpower, which was his coding skill and his knowledge of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So the Silk Road is where this whole story starts. How did the Silk Road help to build up Bitcoin and crypto in general? I mean, Silk Road plays a very important role in the development, the history of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency itself, because the original people around the, the ultimate mystery guy here is somebody allegedly named Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the founder of Bitcoin, inventor of Bitcoin, although that's widely assumed to be a pseudonym, and nobody to this day knows who it was who actually invented cryptocurrency. Silk Road, though, was like the first test case where you could actually buy something uh, at, at all in the real world with this digital currency. It happened to be that what they were selling was drugs and guns and pornography and a lot of dark web stuff. Eamon, in the documentary, people will see step by step how the feds went to go about finding this thief. Why was it so important to tell the story that way? Well, I think it's a classic whodunit, right? I mean, it starts with a mystery, and there is this massive theft. I mean, it's, a, it's an astonishing theft of $3 billion. And you imagine, okay, what is this person going to do with it? How is it going to change their life? How is it going to change the world around them that they have this access to this money? And what about the law enforcement folks who are trying to figure this out? How are they going to do that? 
Well, we talked to the law enforcement folks. We talked to the IRS criminal investigations team who were on this case. We talked to the outside consultant on this case. We, we talked to the athens Clark County Police Department in Athens, Georgia, uh, who were the detectives working this case. Uh, and they laid out for us step by step this detective story of how they came to solve this incredible mystery, one of the incredible original mysteries of cryptocurrency that has fascinated a lot of people for years. And now we know a whole lot not everything, but a whole lot about what happened there. I think one question people have when they check this out, Eamon, is why in the world did Jimmy call the police when that robbery was made? So I ask you the question, why do you think he did it? At the moment somebody broke into Jimmy Zong's house on the outskirts of Athens, Georgia, uh, he was really focused on this idea of developing a group of friends. And these were people that he partied in the bars with. He would, he's the kind of guy who would order a round for the entire bar, spend hundreds of dollars in 10 seconds on drinks for everybody in the bar, and then bring everybody back to his house uh, for the after hours party. Uh, I think Jimmy Zong was uh, very committed to the idea of developing this core group of friends. And we have uh, you know, the audio of that 911 call, and you can hear kind of the panic in his voice. At one point he says, I'm having a panic attack about losing all this money. And I, and I, I don't think it was the amount of money, which was something on the order of $400,000, that was concerning to him, because as we find out, Jimmy had a lot more money than that. I think that what really caused that panic was the idea that one of his own friends may have betrayed him. He hired a private investigator who we also talked to, Robin Martinelli in Georgia, uh, and she looked into the case uh, and came to the conclusion that it was probably one of Jimmy's close friends who did this. And I think the feeling of betrayal that Jimmy Zong had, that somebody close to him may have been the one who stole from him, that kind of outrage at the, the existence of this crime against him and the feeling of vulnerability that it might be one of his friends, I think was the reason he picked up the phone in the first place to call 911. When people watch the documentary, they'll also learn more about Jimmy and what happens to him and the whole story in general. But you spoke to his attorney and you learned a little bit more about him personally, his family, his dog. Why was it important to tell that part of the story? We learned a lot about Jimmy's childhood and some of it is tough. You just get a sense of a person who is just so desperately longing for uh, human connection and so sort of fundamentally unable to find that connection. There's a lot of chatter these days about crypto, given the fact that Sam bankman fried is on trial. What does this story tell us about crypto, Eamon? Look, I mean, this story is uh, in many ways a proto Sam Bankman Freed, right? I mean, this goes back to the earliest days of Bitcoin, and, and we learned some surprising things about just how far back in the history of Bitcoin Jimmy Zong actually goes. And I think that's a revelation in and of itself. Uh, but we talked to Nathaniel Popper, who's an author uh, of a book called Digital Gold, who studied the history of Bitcoin. And he has a line in the documentary, which I think is kind of profound, which is, you know, when you go back and study the original group of characters who built cryptocurrency in the first place, there were people who were simultaneously heroes and villains in that story. And he said he sees that theme throughout the history of Bitcoin and throughout the, the story of Jimmy as well. Hey, I mean, you've told a lot of great stories over the years. What do you personally take away from this one you think back on it now? To me, this is a rare case where you can actually see an investigation unfold uh, in front of you, but also a case where you, know, you can see an investigation that has some profound significance beyond just, you know, that here was a crime and an alleged criminal and a solution to the crime. I think maybe the theme of the documentary is, you know, can money buy you love? Um, and I think we know what, you know, all the great poets have said about that. And I think that expresses itself again in the documentary as well. Well, I'm excited for people to check this one out. Eamon, thanks for the time, man. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, thanks. Absolutely. Yep.